Hi everybody, Fide Master Dennis Montecruz is here, and it's time after quite a while, several weeks at least, well more than a month, um, to do our monthly show on uh, viewer games. So I try to do it once a month, um, last time I think it was more towards the beginning of the month, and this time it's at the end. So um, we're a bit behind, I've got quite a few games to look at, and I'm not going to catch up in this show, so I, next week I think I'm going to try to catch up on the rest. Uh, those of you who often submit shows, please, you know, take a month off, maybe two months off. Uh, and that includes the person whose game we're going to take a look at now, El Presidente Graham Cridland. Um, he's got a couple of games in the show. And, you know, you know who you are, the usual suspects. So it's not that I mind um, having your games, but, you know, I, I uh, would prefer slightly lower numbers and kind of spread the, um, spread the fun around. So let everyone have a, have a shot at it. All right. So anyway, let's start with this game. It's uh, I think one that has um, some interesting moments and um, and some interesting points for discussion too. So he's white against Joshua Friedland, and the game begins with a Caro can and with this knight h3 sideline. And sometimes knight one to e2 is played instead of this. Uh, almost always they'll they'll transpose into um, one into another. So uh, Graham writes this. He says I have used this Caro can sideline for a number of years. Because many non-masters don't think of the equalizing lines, which almost all involve e7 and e5, there are two problems. First, is there a way to keep the game going after black plays e7, e5, as in uh, Rajabov Anand? And he says, a few other, uh, a few ideas about how to think about these open positions would help. They come up in other openings too, but without pawns in the center. I often run out of things to do. And then second, he asks, how should a player in the 1800 to 2200 ELO range think about unclear sacrifices? How do you go about evaluating positions where there is material, a material slash initiative offset? This opening leads to a lot of opportunities to chop on e6. Well, that's true. So this, this line, when black doesn't really know what's coming, can be extremely dangerous. I mean, if black plays some kind of uh, passive setup with, let's say, e6, knight f6, knight b to d7, maybe bishop to e7, white's going to play knight f4, bishop c4, h4, maybe queen e2, and then try to have some glorious sacrificial uh, massacre via the e6 square. So first sack a piece there and uh, just swarm black's poor poor king. But as, as he rightly pointed out, black has um, a number of ways to pretty easily neutralize this variation, including lines with, with e7 to e5. And frankly, okay, he's asking, well, how do you keep this going? And I think there isn't any way to keep it going, which is why people don't play this. I mean, Rajabov tried it as a one-off. He got nothing. And uh, that was that. So, um, you know, that's kind of the, uh, the the game you're playing. I mean, you're, you're, you're taking a chance. You're hoping the guy doesn't know how to play against it. And if he doesn't, then, you know, great. You get to win uh, an attractive game. But if he does, well, then you just have to try to play from nothing and, and outplay the guy. So um, to give the line or the, give the game reference that he mentioned. So Rajabov Anand, I believe, was this. And then the key idea with this e5 idea is that now black has this, and then he regains the pawn quite easily. The b2 pawn is hanging, so white plays queen e2. And then we have the swap. And really, white has nothing here. And the reason why white doesn't have anything here, even though he has the bishop here, is that his extra bishop, the light square bishop, doesn't have any really clear prospects. I mean, if it goes to d3, it bites on the pawn on g6. If it goes to f3, it bites on the pawn on c6. And you can go to, c, to c4. So, I mean, that by, by kind of a process of elimination would be the uh, perhaps the best square for it. But, but still, black is just doing fine. I mean, you can play uh, bishop to d6 or bishop c5, castle kingsider play king f8, and simply lift the rook to um, h4. And, uh, and really, black doesn't have any serious problems. But, you know, white does have the bishop here, and, and someday, if black um, doesn't know how to deal with it, you can make these bishops come to bear. So, objectively, white has nothing here, and experienced players will have no problem, I think, in, in keeping white's uh, bishop here neutralized. But it's something that you can try to play with, and um, I would just suggest playing, playing it against your computer, take the black side, and lo and behold, the computer will find some way of slowly grinding you down, uh, would grind all of us down, most likely. So, um, you know, get some get some ideas from it on how to play this kind of position in case your opponent knows how to uh, how to meet it. 
All right. Um, let me see. Oh, okay. And then the second question: How do you, how do I, um, or how do I think a, a player in the eighteen hundred to twenty two hundred range should think about unclear sacrifices? Well, I, I mean, I would say to some extent the same way anyone does. I mean, I don't know that there's some um, difference. The one difference I would say maybe is that the lower rated players are generally the weaker they are at defending, proportional, or, you know, relative to how well they attack. So. Um, you know, as the further you doubt go down, I mean, I think defense gets worse and worse. So the position that, let's say, gives one player very good attacking chances, or let's say sufficient compensation according to your computer or according to a, an opening book or just according to your, your, your best judgment, um, often if it's really murky, I mean, if there's no clear clear path for the opponent to uh, to just kind of reach a solid defensive position, then I, I think, you know, maybe kick it up uh, an evaluation level. So if it's you think it's dynamically equal, maybe you should view it as slightly better for, for your side, for the side with the attack. Um, now, as far as evaluating in the first place, uh, and this I think holds true for anyone, for any level, uh, essentially you should, or, or one, one of the helpful tips is something that, that Mikhail Tall once said, and, and he said that, if essentially he, he's looking at some kind of sacrifice and after he gets through a number of variations and, and the, the line starts to kind of uh, taper down, you know, it doesn't really um, kind of grow as the variations um, get deeper. Then he thinks, all right, this, this is probably not that interesting. Uh, probably the other guy can, can, can neutralize it. But if when he's calculating, the, the, the tree of variations just grows thicker and thicker and thicker and, and gets deeper and deeper, and, um, you know, there's just many uh, ways for either side to go, that's when he thinks that these kind of speculative sacrifices are, are good, where there are more possibilities available. So I would say, yeah, I mean, if you feel like um, there's no clear way for the other guy to, uh, to break the attack, you see a lot of different approaches that are available, then those are the kinds of, of um, un imbalanced sacrifices that that are worth considering. So that's how I would kind of view it. You know, so you should have at least a couple of pawns for a piece most of the time. But but the key thing is that you don't see any way for your opponents to just uh, kind of stop the fun. So as long as it just stays murky, no matter how far you, you're able to calculate, then that's the kind of position that you should you should go for it. Sometimes you'll be wrong, but that's all right. So um, do what you can with it. Okay, well, back to our game. So black played knight to d7, knight f4. Again, this e5 idea works just fine with the idea of, again, queen a5 check and taking, and you get this equal ending. Black played this. Okay, again, e5. I, I would note, though, here that um, instead of um, Graham's suggested queen to e2, when you end up again with this, fairly dry ending, that instead, white could castle short. And I think this is a bit livelier. So uh, rook e1, let's say king f8, which isn't really that big of a concession because the rook on the h file is well placed. Um, but then c3, you know, maybe queen b3 is coming in the future, maybe bishop to g5. This, I think, uh, white has some prospects. All right, so back to the game. Black played e6 here, h4. And even this really is nothing serious yet for, um, for white. Black played knight to b6, and now I think white's a little bit better after bishop to b3, but on bishop to d6, I think black is still doing fine. One of the key things that black needs to, to, to bear in mind is that giving up the bishop here in this variation really isn't so bad. Black is extremely solid. I mean, that's the fundamental strength of the Karo can, is its solidity, and, and I think black is doing just fine here. I mean, remember, too, you, you Karo canners, that, um, for instance, let me go back to move two. Knight f3, in this two knights variation that was favored for a couple of years by Fisher without good results. Uh, bishop to g4 is considered very good, and on h3, black just takes. One way of thinking about the Karo can, at a very high level of abstraction, is that it's uh, a French, a tempo down, but where you're taking care of the problem of the bad bishop first. So, um, you know, the point is not that this bishop is going to become some powerhouse. But very often, black is quite happy to exchange it away and, and then set up a, a French kind of pawn structure, just this very solid pawn structure. So um, back to here, bishop to d6, h5, 
bishop e4, no big deal. Takes, takes. Okay, white can throw in h6. Black plays g6. And black has no real problems here. So again, his position is quite solid. The queen may come to f6. But whatever he does, maybe the queen just goes to c7. The knight goes back from e4 to f6. Black has nothing really to complain about here. All right, so black played knight to b6 instead. Bishop to b3. Bishop d6. h5. Here, takes and takes. And then here we have this kind of back and forth, where both sides should play h6 pretty much as soon as possible. So white should have played h6 here, and then, for instance, after queen f3, and then knight to d3, this is a nice move, white's better because, well, black has, uh, because these pawns are both advanced, he's got some problems with the dark squares. So this knight may come to e5, the bishop comes to g5, um, and so on. So white has a little edge, plus the bishop here. All right, instead, black played queen to d3, knight f6, bishop d2, and here black should play h6, and then it's just, again, flat equal here. Black's situation is very good here because, well, in part because the, the bishop and the pawns complement each other. So he's got the dark square bishop and the pawns controlling lots of light squares. So a uh, very tame kind of position here. Black should play queen c7 in castles. And that's what he does. It's just that he should throw in h6 so white can't play it. And again, okay. And then finally, the last chance. All right, here he goes wrong with e5, and then white takes and plays queen f5 check, knight to d3, and black is in big trouble here, probably just about losing, because after h6, the knight on f6 is loose. And um, you can replay the rest of the game yourself. Um, on the uh, on the website, I don't don't really want to say anything more about this game except to say that White is winning here. So this shows how important H6 can be. But also here, Black would be okay with the good move C5, and uh, this threatens C4. And this is more of a thematic break than E5. I mean, when you play E5, you're you know you're opening up the bishop on B3's diagonal. Um, you know, it's it's. If the king were on b8, it would be okay here, too. So, I mean, it's more a tactical problem, but c5 is really the thematic Carol can break. And think about it this way. Let's say you play c5, and, and white just trades in a normal position. You play bishop c5 and so on. Well, there you've got this extra central pawn, and, and that's not to be undervalued. So when you play e5, you, you're giving up. Both sides are swapping off their central pawns. So that's not necessarily bad for black, all things being equal, but... With c5, I mean, black has the small imbalance in the position that can be useful. Anyway, after c5 here, black is fine. So uh, white has a choice between two moves. In both cases, he has to prove or try to prove equality. For instance, if dc, then we have this long tactical sequence. Bishop takes f4, the queen's under attack. So bishop takes f4, little counterattack here. Rook d3, bishop c7, take, take, take check, and king b6. And black is slightly better here, basically because the uh, the white bishop is not very good. It's it's biting on that e6, f7 pawn structure. So um, I, I would prefer black slightly here. But objectively, this, this should be a draw. Okay, the more wild choice for white is bishop takes e6, but this isn't actually very good. Takes, takes, queen f7. Okay, white can throw in queen f5, which is a good idea, driving the knight back. And now takes queen a2, threatening mate, bishop c3, rook takes d8. And material is about equal. White has a rook and a pawn for two knights. But again, all things being equal, if it's a middle game, generally the uh, the miners are better than the uh, the rook and pawn. In an ending, the rook and pawn are generally better than the, than the minor pieces, especially if it's two knights. Anyway, no problems here for black, um, as opposed to the game where allowing that queen f5 check, knight d3, h6, little mini combination, left black uh, with a lost position, just losing a pawn, everything fell apart. Okay, so let's uh, go on to the next game here. And this is a game between some anonymous player and Krumov. Krumov, and Krumov have black, so here we go. d4, c6, c4, d5, takes, takes, knight c3, and here, uh, black played a6. Now, a6 does often get played in the um, in the exchange Slav, but generally not so quickly. I mean, there's no real rush for this move. So it's much more common to play knight c6, and I, I would say better. Knight f3, knight f6, bishop f4. 
And, um, and now black has a choice between several moves. There's bishop to f5. This is the main move. Probably objectively the best move, too. Uh, e6 is playable. I mean, th these moves are all fine. I mean, there's nothing wrong with any of them. And then also a6. This is also a perfectly good move here. Um, in part to keep the knight off of b5, and sometimes white's bishop off of b5. And it's also kind of a, a high-class waiting move with the idea that on e3, black can play bishop to g4 and swap off his fairly mediocre bishop for the decent white knight and then play e6. Well, he'll take, play e6, bishop d6, and so on with um, a very easy game. White generally tries to avoid this easy swap uh, and plays rook to c1 instead. All right, well, anyway, that's a little very, very basic um, exchange slot theory. But a6 seems premature. Anyway, now white plays uh, a really insipid system with a g3. I like Fianchetto openings for white if, if, big if, you can put pressure on the long diagonal. But here there's no real prospect for, for pressure at all. And if white plays for e4, he's going to end up with this isolated d-pawn in a situation that doesn't really seem especially promising. So I don't, I don't see any obvious good way for white to achieve um, e4 where his d-pawn won't simply be weak for free. I mean, isolated d-pawn positions are, are one of the, uh, the mainstays, really, of, of chess. I mean, it's one of the most common structures that you can get. But white is generally going for some kind of initiative, whether building up for a kingside attack or good central play. But with a fianchetto, I mean, it's it's a little bit of a, um, a dry setup. And again, especially here, black can develop so naturally that this doesn't doesn't look overwhelmingly promising. And if you don't go for that, then then white has nothing. There's no pressure on the diagonal. So knight c6, bishop g2, knight f6, knight f3, bishop to f5, castles. Here, by the way, I, I would at least very seriously consider the move h6. Not to stop bishop to g5, but so that way on knight h4 we can play bishop to h7. So after e6, white in turn should consider knight to h4. And instead he played a3, which has the the idea of playing b4, which it's okay, but uh, I don't think it's that great here. It doesn't make as much sense as it sometimes does. So here black, again, could consider h6, and also rook to c8 as a, as a prophylactic move. Well, the rook belongs on the open file anyway, but here in particular, if b4, there's knight takes b4, followed by rook takes c3. So that's uh, a further point. So bishop d7 is, you know, it's okay, but it's a little compliant. And also I'd probably, probably rather have the bishop on d6, where it at least um, can fight against bishop to f4. On e7, there's no real, no really big purpose since if bishop to g5, we would just play h6 anyway. There's no, nothing serious about this pin. All right, so b4, b5. Okay, and now um, both sides should strive to put a knight on on c5 or for black c4. But okay, we saw bishop to b2. Now bishop to b2 is another move I don't like um, because well, the obvious question is what exactly is this bishop doing? It's behind this wall of dark squared pawns. So uh, it would be a, a much better idea to put it on f4, where it's on a clean diagonal and controlling the center, or put it even on g5, where at least it can be exchanged off. On b2, it's just a, a terrible piece. So castles, rook c1, rook c8, knight e5. Okay, here black took on e5, which isn't bad. Maybe better is queen to b6, forcing the uh, rather insipid e3. And then one idea would be to play bishop to d6, trying to encourage white to make the exchange. Uh, white could play f4, but that really weakens a lot of light squares, like e4. And if he takes, then we play rook c6, and he's helping us to double on the file. So even when you're going to make an exchange, you should always try to figure out what conditions um, make that exchange best for me. So I think knight takes e5 is actually a slightly poor move. And the reason is that after de knight to d7, white can play e4, and um, all of a sudden, let's say if, if d takes e4, knight takes e4, now white's position looks actually pretty pretty sensible. Um, all of a sudden, the, the, the long diagonal, well, both diagonals are, are much more open than they were. The knight can jump into d6, perhaps, and if black takes, then white recaptures and has the bishop here. The light square bishop is beautifully open. The pawn on e5 is a nice wedge. 
all of a sudden. So here, White's position makes really good sense. So Knight takes e5. I mean, this, you know, you look at this position, you can see White's bishops are both incredibly stupid. We go from that to this, and all of a sudden, White's bishops look terrific, right? Especially if, let's say, White plays something like Knight to d6, Bishop takes d6, and maybe e takes d6. Um, you know, then both bishops are just um, are just flying across the board. Okay, well, White played f4, which is not not a good move. Um, now here, Black should play, I think, Knight to b6, just jumping into c4. I mean, it's a beautiful square. And, and as I said, I mean, from the moment when this b4, b5 um, pairing of moves occurred, I mean, instantly, both players should be looking very vigilantly for ways to put their knights on the outpost and prevent their opponent from doing the same thing. So here again, knight to b6 would be extremely logical. Instead, black played rook to c4, which is, um, it just doesn't really make very good sense here because, well, first of all, the knight, no, sorry, the rook doesn't really do anything special on c4 that it wasn't doing on c8 already. And secondly, and most important, it's taking away the, the knight square. That's, that's the piece that belongs there. Okay, well, again, white should play e4, get rid of his doubled pawns, and um, break up black center so the bishop on g2 can come to life. So instead, he played e3, knight to b6, and now white very helpfully played knight to e2, encouraging black to correct his mistake. So rook takes c1, queen c1, knight c4. Okay, so now the knight is found its, its, its ideal location. All right, knight to d4, bishop g6, rook e1, queen a8, not a bad move at all. Bishop f1, rook c8, takes. And now here, um, instead of rook takes c4, which is very natural looking, again, uh, putting the rook on c4 isn't the best move, although it's not really a mistake here. But d takes c4 would be better, opening up this uh, very promising, for black, not for white, long diagonal. Well, I guess it's promising for, for white in the sense that it promises doom and destruction, but but not, not good promise. Um, so this would definitely be the way to go. And as we'll see in the game, this, this diagonal has um, great potential for, for black. So rook c4, queen d2, bishop d8. I, I like this idea. So he puts the uh, bishop on a, on a more promising, more active diagonal. Certainly one more threatening to white's king. d takes e4 is good as well. And now bishop to e4. Absolutely. Don't trade the queens here. I mean, you've got nice long-term attacking chances. So queen d5, good centralizing move. Queen c3. Now here I think black maybe, well not maybe, I, I think black can definitely improve on what he did. Though his move isn't bad. He played bishop to h1. But black, uh, sorry, white can I think hold on against the threats if it's just that diagonal that he has to worry about. So what I think black should do is give him a second diagonal to worry about. So let's play f6. And then we're going to play e5. So let's say a4, just to throw a move out there. e5. And now the queen's ready to come to d1. The bishop on b6 is becoming active. And black is really just breaking through here. And and white is not going to have time to play queen takes e5 and give mate on g7. I mean, he'll get mated on g2 before that happens. Okay, so in the game was bishop to h1. White stopped the mate threat. Bishop b4, queen c3, bishop to d3. So black is trying to find some arrangement where he can get the queen on the business end and put the bishop behind it. All right, queen d2. Um, and here, Krimov gives a very good variation. I would have given it if he didn't. So instead of queen e4, which is what he played, uh, bishop takes d4. Actually, I should say one other thing. Uh, another idea that you should consider, though the, the variation he gives is absolutely right here, but in general h5, h4 is another very useful way to play. Um, and then, of course, taking. This is going to give you access to more, more squares as well. You can either play for h3 or h takes g3. All right, anyway, the variation is bishop takes d4. And the instructive aspect of this is, um, well, the, the main point is a tactical one that we can now put the queen in front. But it also illustrates a very important point, which is that obstacle or bishops favor the attacker. So sure, in an end game, when it's just those bishops, it's very often the case that uh, having this, um, having obstacle colored bishops increases the weaker size drawing um, possibilities greatly. But 
if it's an attacking situation, opposite colored bishops are a tremendous advantage because you can see white's dark squared bishop is, you know, it might as well be a pawn. I mean, it has absolutely nothing to do with what's going on around the white king. It just complements all the other pawns by being on the same square. So, okay, black is threatening queen f1 mate. Let's say queen c1, bishop to e4. Okay, well, what now? Queen g2 mate is threatened. So let's say queen f1. Now check, and now check, and then you take on g3, and the fun continues. So this is um, white falling apart here. So the attack goes on. White's going to have two. Black's going to have two extra pawns. He's got a passed c pawn. He's going to have a passed h pawn. And again, White's bishop has just nothing to do with what's happening in the game. All right. Instead, Black played queen e4, bishop c3, h6. Again, h5 would be more logical, trying to break up the uh, the position. So, for instance, you could have something like this: h5, h4 takes. The queen goes to h7. The bishop goes to h4. And you're trying to break in that way. All right, so not all forced, but I mean, just to illustrate uh, a possible possible plan. Or you could play h4 and then queen h7 and wait to, to exchange, so that way there's no queen h2 for white. Anyway, from here, white played king f2, which was just a, a blunder. Queen h1, and now black is, has broken through and is just winning, completely winning. White played knight f3, which was even worse because of queen f1 mate. Okay, so uh, not a bad game by, by black. So some, some definite inaccuracies, but uh, very, very nice exploitation of the weak light squares on the king side. Okay, on to the next one. So again, this is a, a Graham Cridland game. He's black against Hannon Russell, the uh, famous publisher. So Hannon Russell is the, the man who started the Chess Cafe website. I believe he's turned it over now to Mark Donlan, but he uh, still runs Russell Enterprises, which is a very good book publisher. They've been putting out some books by Mark Dvoretsky, among others. Um, and he's also, uh, Russell that is, is um, I think he's been a master and he's still a pretty highly rated expert. All right, so uh, Graham is only 1747 in this game, but still manages to win. This was played back in 2005. All right, so I don't want to say too much about this game. I'll just very quickly play through it, but I have a couple of quick comments. All right, so we have uh, basically a King's Indian attack. And, okay, it's nothing so special. It's just a kind of typical idea. Uh, I will say one thing. All right, so, uh, you know, uh, Graham annotates his games on, on the site, and he makes a comment that knight to c4 is more common than rook to e1, but not meaningfully better. Well, you know, it, it's kind of, uh, I think it's not a really, not a very helpful comment in the sense that, I mean, yeah, I mean, we're talking about opening choices here. So it's, it's not like any opening is going to be meaningfully better than Another, if you mean that, you know, if I play knight f3 against the Sicilian as opposed to knight c3, it's not like I'm winning. But it, it leads to a different kind of, uh, different character of play. So, yeah, I mean, it's not a matter of white getting nothing in one variation and having a clear advantage in another, but, but the play is, is, uh, quite different. So it's not a matter of, um, how much advantage, it's just that, you know, the, the, the positions can become, can become, um, different. Alright, so rookie one a6, e5, and here, all right, so here Black uh, decided to go on to the attack. And, and clearly, um, uh, El Presidente, as he, uh, as he has chosen for himself uh, that, that name here, uh, is, is a player who loves to attack. And here he comes up with the idea of knight g4 and bishop to d4, which is very aggressive. And um, actually worked out all right, but it's um, not clearly the best. But the movie suggests it's an improvement may not be the the best move either. I mean, I think they're all just choices at this point. So bishop to e6, he just gives his equal, but I'm not sure that it is. And the reason is that white has this promising exchange sack with rook takes e6. So for instance, takes and queen to e2. And I think white's actually going to be a little bit better because black's light squares are very, very weak. And one of the nice things about this particular version of the king's Indian attack is that... Um, White often gets very, very good control over the e5 square as well. In, in general, you can see that white's pieces are, are going to be very harmoniously placed. I mean, the queen will take, the knight can go to c4 and maybe go to, to e5, the bishop comes to f4, this bishop's on a, a beautiful diagonal, and so on. And it's not really clear uh, how black whips up any kind of serious play of his own. Now, 
you might say, well, it doesn't mean to use up material, but it's not very much. I mean, I think it was maybe half a pawn or three quarters of a pawn um, up, but his e7 pawn is weak. White has very active pieces. And again, uh, white has light squared problems, as, or black has light squared problems as well. So I think white is better here. And if white tries to hold on to this pawn, well, that's not a good idea. Queen c8 is met by bishop to h3. And if black insists with king to f7, okay, then knight f3. So now we're threatening knight to g5 check. And if h6, well, this is this is an oops. Knight e5 check, knight takes g6, and black can set up the board for the next game. Um, white already has the one pawn. He's threatening to take the rook. He's threatening the fork on knight e with knight e7. And he's threatening this fork as well if bishop takes e6. So this is just losing for black. Now, of course, black doesn't have to just lose, but still, I think after queen e2, white is better. So knight to g4 may or may not be the best move, but I don't think bishop to e6 is just a perfect solution either. Uh, here, white could play rook to d5. This is fine. But rook to e2 is okay as well, and rook to e1 is fine. So all these moves are okay. So rook e1, bishop to d4. And now, though, rook to e2 is important to play, uh, as, as Graham points out. So white's a little bit better here. He's going to play h3 and start driving the uh, the black pieces back with, with the small edge. All right, knight to e4 is what white played instead, but after f5, black is, is a little bit faster. So c3, f takes e4, c takes d4. Um, maybe queen to b3 check is, well, I don't think that's even better. I think it's black is just better here, period. Um, here, black should play queen takes d4, takes here, and in this position, black is slightly better, but not a lot better after bishop to e3. So just, just a touch um, better for white here, or for black. But still, better to be slightly better than slightly worse. In the game, he played knight takes f2, which is uh, an appealing move to make, but queen to b3 check more or less lets um, white off the hook for the worst of it. Okay, uh, maybe rook to f7 is best now. Okay, black played king to g7, takes, queen d4, bishop d3. Very unusual position. Um, but here, with king h1, again, as Graham points out, after all of this, white's a bit better. So he's got, the material is even, and the big difference here is that he has um, a reasonable bishop here. And it's important to note that after king to g1, knight to d3, uh, actually, let me think about this. Okay, bishop to d4, check e5. Yeah, and then bishop to c3. Okay, so that's that's the key. So the point is that on this, we have this check, and then we get this guy. And it looks to me like this should definitely favor white. And if he can't take on e1, then the rook just runs away, and white's again better with his bishop here, and um, potential pressure against the e5 pawn. Okay, so in the game, bishop to h3 happened, bishop h3, queen c5. And here, uh, part of the fun of this game is that it's it's a very nice illustration of what we just saw in the last game. Opposite colored bishops and the attack. And, and this time, both sides get to attack. So that's part of the fun of this. So rook b to e8, protecting the e7 pawn. Rook a to d1, queen b3, queen g5, king g8, queen d5 check, bishop to e6. Okay, and now... Instead of swapping queens and um, having a safer position, Russell decides to, to go for it. It doesn't work out. Bishop to g4, bishop to d4, threatening mate, rook f6, rook c1, uh, maybe rook to d2. Also makes sense, covering the second rank, but plays more aggressively with rook c1. Bishop h3, rook to e3. And now, a little puzzle for you. Black to move, what should he do? Well, here black played queen to c2, and this worked out to be the winning move. But objectively, it's probably better for him to grab the pawn, and white has maybe a little compensation, but basically, um, you know, both sides still have reasonable attacking chances, and black just has a pawn in his pocket. But queen to c2 is uh, quite, a, quite a naughty little move. So it threatens to take the rook. More than that, it threatens queen g2 mate. And if rook takes c2, then rook to f1 is mate. So what in the world is white to do here? Well, in the game, he couldn't find anything. He played queen to d5 check. 
Black played king to f8, and white just resigned. So it was a very nice finish, and black was happy about it. And I'm sure I would have been happy about it too. But white has a defense. See if you can find it. You know that it's there. But what is it? The answer, queen to e6 check. So a spectacular move. It's the only move, but it's what saves the day. The point is that either capture will eliminate the rook f1 mate possibility. And, um, well, there isn't any other choice. I mean, if, if king to f8 or, you know, king anywhere, white can play queen takes f6 check and then take the queen, and it'll just be up a rook for nothing and winning the game. So black has to take, and then after this, black just covers the back rank, and he's fine. It's about equal. All right, so a, a very, very uh, entertaining finish. Neat little, uh, you know, pair of matching queen sacrifices, except that Russell missed his. So, um, so El Presidente won his game. Okay, on to the next one. So this is between uh, Zykiel and Only Great. How modest. Um, so Only Great submitted this and uh, was black in the game. So he said, okay, the game was played online. The time controls for 30 minutes per player for the whole game. The wolf was only spent about 10 to 15 minutes. And he says, I generally have trouble with the English. And after just his second move, I had no idea what to do. I'd like to see what you think about this game and find where I could have improved. Okay, well, what the first thing I would say in, um, in addressing the question about how to face the English is that I, I always tell students or whoever who's, who's, that's uh, asking about this, what you should do, first, first of all, if you can, is to, to try to find a line against the English which squares with what you normally play anyway against 1d4. So, for instance, if you play the uh, the queen's gambit, when you when you see c4, well, you should play e6 and go for, you know, play d5 next and knight f6 and, and so on. So play it like the queen's gambit if you can. If you play the slav, well, play the slav, play c6. If you like uh, a king's Indian, then play knight f6 and follow up with g6. If you like the Nimzo Indian, play knight f6 and follow up with e6. So you get the picture. Um, if you play e4 with white and like to face the Sicilian, well, play 1e5 and go for uh, a reverse Sicilian. So think about it a lot from that kind of logic. I mean, I, I guess it's only if you don't have, um, if none of those appeal to you, you know, then you have to think, figure something else out. And then also, do you like more balanced play or imbalanced play? If you like you know, slightly quieter play, then, then c5 as played in the game certainly makes sense. Um, you know, e5 is a more imbalanced approach. And then also there's a kind of its own distinctive thing, which is the English defense to the English opening, which is b6. And um, this is also a very interesting line as well, so I can certainly uh, suggest that you look this up if you're curious. Anyway, c4, c5 is what happened in the game, g3, and then here black has numerous options of which the most common are g6, right back at white, uh, knight c6, and knight to f6. Black played d6, and, and while this certainly isn't a bad move, it's it's inflexible. I mean, you don't really know that you want to play d6. And and in a way, it really uh, helps white. I mean, with by playing g3, white is announcing very clearly that what he wants to do is control the light squares. So he's, he's not playing knight f3, where the knight might block the bishop. So he's got this pawn on c4, it's controlling d5, the bishop's going to go to g2, knight goes to, to c3. And you can see that everybody is piling up on d5, and of course the long diagonal as well. The knight also hits e4, as does the bishop. So with that in mind, I mean, a move like d6, putting all of your guys on dark squares, not all of your guys, but all of your pawns, um, is just more or less surrendering and saying, no, please, take the light squares. I, I don't want to use them. You, you can have all the control over them that you want. So I don't really like it for that reason. But, you know, finding a defense, I mean, I would say what you should do is, is kind of a answer the questions that I was asking before about what your, your usual favorite openings are. Okay, well, let's go on with the game. Bishop g2, knight f6, knight c3, knight c6. And here, white played the weird queen to a4. Okay, so now this has nothing to do with normal English theory uh, or anything like that anymore. So bishop to d7 happened, queen to b3, knight a5. And um, here, white should just play queen to c2. 
And then the point being that on knight c4, you can play bishop takes b7. All right. So this is worth whatever it's worth. And um, certainly black is doing fine here, but um, at least white's not losing a pawn. So in the game, white played queen a3, and yeah, very strangely, black's uh, decided to play bishop c6 rather than just grab the pawn for free with tempo, as he pointed out. So yeah, I mean, what's what's so uh, fantastic about White's bishop that it just must be traded off at this exact moment? Um, you know, and not only that, but when you play bishop to c6, I mean, what exactly... Well, okay, your knight's going to come back into play, so that's not really an issue. But yeah, I mean, it's not that bishop c6 is a bad move in its own right. It's perfectly fine, but yeah, I mean, the, the pawn is worth more than the uh, the value of making this immediate exchange. Anyway, takes, takes, queen a4, g6, queen b5. And here another move that I, I, I just don't understand. Um, here black played queen to c8 rather than queen to d7. So, of course, I understand that queen c8 protects the, the pawn. That, that's perfectly good. But on c8, instead of d7, you're keeping the queen passive, slightly more passive, and you're blocking in the rook, and you're keeping this, this pin uh, alive. Now... That's not very serious. The pin really means almost nothing here. But, you know, I, I, the, the part about leaving the rook hemmed in on, on a8, I don't, I don't really understand that. So, generally speaking, I mean, if you can develop a piece, whatever the piece is, to a, a more aggressive square, and there's no obvious cost to doing so, then do it. Grab space, and, you know, don't, don't have your pieces. When you develop your pieces, you don't want them to create traffic jams. You don't want them to step on each other's toes. All right, well, here white makes a very poor move, e3. Now, it's, it's, a, it's a move that makes sense. So it's not, it's not a, uh, an illogical move, but it's a poor move because now f3, and, and the light squares in general, I mean, d3, these squares are all very, very weak now. Um, so it would have been much better for him to deal with this threat of, well, there isn't even a threat of knight to d4, thanks again to this pin, um, but it would have made more sense for him to play knight f3. And someday, when black was ready to play knight to d4, white can make the exchange. Okay, so e3, bishop g7, knight g to e2, castles, knight to d5, takes, takes, and here uh, another uh, tactical inaccuracy here. So you might want to try to figure out what black should have done, especially if this is quote-unquote only great watching this. So I would say the move to play here is just knight to b4. Nice little double attack. So we're threatening knight to c2 check, winning the rook. And we're threatening knight takes d5. Now white can cover both squares with queen c4, but then queen f5. And we just renew the threat. And with a third threat as well of knight to d3 check, which is even even more devastating maybe, because if king f1, queen f2 is mate. If king d1, knight takes f2, and then knight h1. So um, this would just be winning. So you're threatening knight to d3, you're threatening knight c2, and you're threatening a take on d5. So a6 chases the queen back to a better square, though he doesn't um, he doesn't want to look success in the mouth, so he makes sure that you can now get a new fork. So you play knight to e5, which isn't bad, but knight to b4 is even better. So if he wants to hold on to the pawn, he's got to try queen e4, but now just f5, and, um, and black is doing great. Queen b1, knight takes d5. Extra pawn, much better position, it's winning. All right, so instead, knight to e5, which isn't bad, queen e4. And now, again, I play f5, taking advantage of his overloaded queen. I mean, I'd love to, to check here on f3 or on d3, but his queen's covering both squares. So if we play f5, well, he's got to give ground. Here, now this. And now I like b5 here with the idea of queen b7 and queen takes d5. And white has just tons of trouble here. For instance, d3, queen b7, e4. And now, okay, this is a very good position to think about what to do. White's development is extremely poor here. I mean, he only has one piece off the back rank, and just barely. His king is uh, in, in, in trouble. Okay, he's got problems on the f file, potentially. He's got problems on this diagonal, potentially. We just have to find some way of really just exploding the middle of the board so all of our pieces can come and, and uh, crush crush the white king. So the answer is e6, and this breaks through. So for instance, now if knight f4, trying to keep everything glued together like this, 
Well, now we take, and now queen f7, and white is not going to survive this. Uh, the obvious threat at the moment is knight to d2 check, followed by queen f2 mate. And um, you know, we can also augment our attack with this. We can also play rook a to e8. Anyway, black is winning here. So in the game, black played b5, which, you know, it'd be nice to have this move in for free, but it really doesn't have much to do with what's going on immediately in the game. I mean, the immediate problems are these terribly weak light squares in the center and on the king side. And, you know, so what does b5 have to do with that? I mean, there is the idea of maybe playing for f5, queen b7, queen d5, but first let's play f5 and see where his queen goes and only then decide. So here White should just castle and, and get out of town, get his king to relative safety, and then this knight f3, knight d3 stuff is nowhere near as serious. Instead, okay, he plays d4, still asking for trouble, and here we should again play f5, and then we get our check in. All right, instead c takes d4, e d4, and here Black had another good move. And again, the same theme, queen c4. So he can't take because the queen's hanging, and once again we want to play knight to d3. So we're again trying to put as much pressure on the uh, on the white king as we possibly can while we still can. All right, so knight c4 happened instead. Castles. And now white has at least managed to achieve, well, it's, it's still a kind of a miserable position, but it's at least a normal position. So he's not getting made anymore. He can develop kind of normally. Uh, he's going to lose a pawn probably. So that, that pawn on d5 is probably going to drop but, you know, the, the worst of it is over for him. All right, but now black starts playing some good moves. Queen b7 is very good, and now knight to b6, and the pawn on d5 is going to drop. Okay, white didn't even bother trying to defend it, and then here black should have taken on d5 with the queen. This would have been best. Just up a pawn for nothing with a great position, and um, white has bad minor pieces too, and the d4 pawn is a little bit weak. And the point here is that if queen e7... Rook f to e8 wins because queen c7, and now black gets a two for one deal. So black gets to ca capture two of white's minor pieces. White only got one of black's. All right, instead e6, and now it's a little bit messier again. Knight four. Um, here black played e takes d5. I think knight takes d5 is a bit better. And the idea is that, okay, we're just going to trade everything off here, and now. Um, Black is better, of course he's up a pawn, but you might think, well, who cares? You know, a pawn like that, I mean, d5 and d6, they're just doubled, they're isolated, and um, and they're blockaded. So, you know, what, what value do they have? Well, not much, a little bit, but not much. But the main thing is that white still stands worse because this pawn on d4 is on a dark square. So it's it's hemming in his bishop, and it's a target for, for black's bishop. So white white is definitely much worse here. Not losing, but it's uh, it's quite good for black. So after e takes d5, queen f3, I would say because there are a few more pieces on the board, those um, those factors are a little bit less significant. But still, black is definitely better, no question. Okay, here white plays the peculiar knight to h3, rook a to c8. Okay, and now um, white, well, the move black played worked beautifully in the game. But it's not the best move. So, again, let me let me encourage you to see if you can think of a better move here for black. I think black has something very good that he can do here. And it's not a tactic. Now, we'd like to play rook c2, but of course it drops the rook on e8. Uh, but we don't want to necessarily give up the file. So that's something we can kind of keep in storage for later. And queen d7 makes sense from that point of view. Maybe preparing to play rook to c2. But a move that I like here is knight to d7. If you look at this position right now, all of black's pieces are pretty well placed. The queen could be a little bit better, that's true, but generally speaking, I mean, the rooks are on good, are on very good open files, the queen on b7, it even has a job to do there, and, um, you know, maybe it supports rook to e4 in some position. The bishop on g7 hits the, the pawn on d4. But the knight on b6 is doing absolutely nothing. Where would it make sense? Well, e4. e4 would be a nice square. So if we play knight to d7, then we can bring the knight to f6, and then go from there to e4, 
And then, well, then it's beautiful. And then we're also threatening to play rook c2. So we'll have the e file closed, so he can't do anything with it. And our pieces can operate on the, on the c file. So I think that's a little bit better than queen d7. Now white just blunders with knight to g5. And black blunders black. <laughs> whoops, let me try that again. Black blunders back with bishop to h6. So um, let me quote something from from um, the, the player who submitted this. So he said, um, h6 would have been much better, but my variation was nice as well. And I would say, well, no, it's it's actually not. It, um, it worked out well, but that's because white blundered yet again. Um, so, you know, it's... It, it's unpleasant to admit when you make a big mistake. Um, you know, I, I understand that as well as anybody else does. I mean, we all like our wins to be these nice model games where it's a masterpiece and, you know, it's almost impossible to even figure out where the other guy went wrong. But, you know, you have to, you have to, you know, you should forgive yourself of your chess sins, but you have to acknowledge the, uh, the so-called sins in the first place. And, I mean, H6 just wins a piece on the spot. I mean, it's just game over here after this. The knight has nowhere to go, and that, that's just game over. Whereas after bishop to h6, white can just play h4, and now the knight's not dropping. f6 is no good because the queen takes f6, and you know if you prepare it, then black, uh, white just plays king to g2, and the knight can return to h3 safely. So bishop to h6 is just as big a blunder as knight to g5. So white threw away a piece, and black failed to take it. All right, but... White makes another blunder with bishop to c1, and this one black caught and um, and took full advantage. So rook c, rook e1, and then rook c1, and bishop to g5. So it's not as good as it could have been, but it's still certainly very good, and um, and black won quite easily after this. Uh, one one move I want to show just very briefly. It's it's not a significant um, remark, but I but I think it's one that could be valuable in similar positions. Okay, so black has done very well here, tying him up. I like king to g7. That's a very nice little finesse. Okay, f3. All right, and now here black played bishop to d4 check, which is certainly okay. And he used it to win this pawn on, on g5 uh, with the little clever trick, and this is what happened in the game, that if queen takes d6, bishop to e5, there are no checks, no good checks anyway. And then it's mate and one. And here, white decided to be very classy and just leave the board for 15 minutes and um, forfeit on time. Okay, so this this is all fine. Nothing wrong with bishop to d4 check. But I would like to play d4. I mean, again, there's nothing really wrong with bishop to d4 check here. But, but d4 is very nice. And um, the point is not so much to play d3, d2, though that's part of it. But now this knight on b6 is ready to jump into d5 and e3. So again, let's use all of our pieces, and uh, very often you can win much more quickly by, by introducing all of the pieces into, into play. And the deep pawn becomes relevant too. All right, so um, not a bad game by black, but, but also uh, some serious mistakes too. So work on the tactics, but, um, but definitely a game with some real positives. Okay, next game. Um, okay, and this is another, another bit of uh, hyper-modesty here. So uh, Gooey Jim, or as he called himself here, I am Gooey Jim. It was ranked 2142, uh, at least in this game. Maybe, maybe it is. Maybe the guy is an I am. I'm not sure who it is, but um, anyway, he um, is 2142 in his fix rating. So he uh, says overall, I think this is a great game. Although I'd appreciate improvements, suggestions. Thanks. Okay. Well, I think it's a very interesting game. Uh, I'm not sure it's a great game, but near the end it becomes very very good so I, I do like the ending but I think most of the way it's kind of a, a battle you know it's, it's it's a good battle back and forth some inaccuracies by both sides um, but but the ending I think becomes uh, very nice so let's let's have a look okay so white plays the Smith Mora black declines it uh, generally at least in the old days it was thought that c4 was the way to go against this but it's uh, certainly not necessary all right, and here I think white has a, a last chance to play c4. But okay, he plays knight b to d2, and black played d6. But I think black can play knight to f6, and this should be pretty decent, actually. So knight c4, d5, and uh, it seems to me that this position should be about equal. 
So that's this is, I think, a reason to like C4. I mean, that's what C4 is is uh, designed to prevent. So um, anyway, black played d6, and white, um, let's say, gets away with this setup for free. So knight c4, bishop g5, castles, queen d2. And then here I think maybe bishop to g4 is a good move, since there's not really any very convenient way for white to deal with the threat of bishop takes f3. Whatever he does is going to involve some concession. So I think black is, is equal here. So this, okay. All right, so you know there there are alternative possibilities all over the place here, but but the the play is pretty logical. Okay, and now here, for instance, I think Black should probably play just the uh, the modest rook to e8. But okay, h6 is played in the game isn't really bad either. So bishop f4, king h7, rook f to e1. Uh, here, Black played knight c to e5. Maybe knight g to e5 is slightly better, since I have the feeling that that knight can be a little bit stranded in some cases. And also if knight to d4, then we can we can swap it off. So we can take, take, and, and then play knight c4 for instance. So in the game after knight c to e5, knight to d4, well now this knight gets to survive and um, okay now queen to e2. So it just looks like black is a little bit awkward here. Nothing really too serious yet but Slightly awkward. Anyway, I think e6 now makes the most sense, either driving the knight to b4 where it's a tiny bit clumsy, or back to e3 and then black can trade off his knight. So black played knight c4, which is okay. Bishop g3, a6, solidifying the uh, pawn structure there. Knight to b4, threatening the pawn and to go into c6. So queen b6, knight d5, queen to d8. Bishop goes back to h4, and now rook to e8 after all. And, okay, so so far it looks like, you know, you have this kind of tacking about, back and forth. White's kind of probing around, trying to get um, black to make some kind of weakening move somewhere. But, you know, overall it has the feeling like nothing really has happened too dramatically yet. But now it gets interesting. Here's where uh, white comes up with a good idea, and black uh, is not up to the challenge. Rook to d3. And all of a sudden, white is going to whip up an attack, and it turns out to be unbelievably strong. Now, black, I think, has to play very, very accurately here, or it's going to be painful. And maybe the move to play here is g5, which is kind of risky, but uh, I think it may be okay. Well, the risk is not if white retreats. So I, I don't think the... Um, the slight loosening of these light squares, like f5 in the diagonal. I don't think that's what's going to kill black, because now he plays knight g to e5. And um, after, for instance, rook back, e6. And so the diagonal stays closed, f5 is covered. I think black is, is okay here. So the interesting thing is what happens on bishop takes g5. And the following analysis is kind of preliminary. I think black survives, but... It's, uh, it's, it's, it's scary, and, and I wouldn't be surprised if there's a win for white. So, hg, rook g3. Okay. Threatening perhaps to take on g4, but also just to play e5 and then e6. I mean, that would be another obvious idea. h3 is another obvious idea. So black has to do something quickly. So let's say e6. Now, uh, one possibility for white is to play knight c7 trying to um, displace the uh, the black queen. So queen c7, queen g4. Now we're threatening to take on g5. Queen comes back. Now knight f3. So we're going to play knight takes g5, and then, for instance, knight takes e6 with um, mate coming on g7. All right, just one idea. So king g8, knight takes g5. And now black has to be, again, very careful. Knight to e5 looks like a very natural move. So we bring a piece back into the attack. Well, sorry, into the defense. We do it with tempo. We get the queen off of the g file. And the knight's protecting the f7 pawn too, so it all looks quite sensible. However, after queen h5, white is going to play f4. And it's, it's just not so easy, still. And even if black plays queen f6, still f4. And... Um, the problem is, okay, if, if queen takes f4, for instance, rook f1, where does the queen go? Only one safe square, queen d2, but then it's mate. 
um, pretty quickly here. Uh, let's see, what's the fastest way to, to do the job? Hmm. Yeah, I don't want to get so brilliant that I that I chase the black king to safety. So, for instance, check here. Knight takes e6, bishop b6, queen check. Right, this is the kind of thing we want to avoid. Let's see. I mean, you can maybe play knight takes f7. This is probably pretty okay. Yeah, I don't see any fantastic ideas for black here. I mean point is that on this, we just start taking things, and uh, we don't stop taking things. So that would be one, one possible variation that leads to a good result for white. Okay, so queen f4 is not going to work. All right, but queen g6 looks all right. What's the problem here? Well, more spectacular stuff. Not, not right away. Queen d1, knight c4, um, e5. Threatening the queen, f5, knight e4. So actually, yeah, this line is, is pretty straightforward. Nothing too spectacular here. Queen f7, check here. Let's say b3. You'd like to take on d6. So bishop f6, takes, takes. And this position is better for white. I mean, white's up a pawn, and he's going to keep that extra pawn, and he still has some attacking chances. So it's probably pretty close to winning for white. Okay. So that was back here. So we were just looking at knight to e5. But instead, black could try queen f6. Now, knight h7 seems to be about as good as there is. Queen g6. And I don't think there's anything better for white than e5. But this is just a draw. Takes, takes. Knight e5. And then we have perpetual. Knight f6. King f8. Knight h7. If king e7, then rook takes g7. And white's up a pawn with a good position. So he's got to go back and to draw. And he can't play king h8 because of rook to h4 check. So g5, I think, holds on here. But it is tricky, and, and certainly there are many more lines that can be tried. After knight g to e5, I think, after rook to g3, <laughs> that white is winning. And um, it's, it seems surprising. I mean, it just doesn't look like black's kingside position is that bad. But I guess it is. And the idea, okay, white has... Uh, a basic idea of playing f4, and then depending on what black does, you're going to play f5, or knight f5, or e5, or sometimes queen h5. Uh, a lot of threats um, show up pretty quickly here. So let's let's have a look at the possibilities. In the game, black played h5. We'll see what happened to that in a moment. If g5 here, unlike last move, well, it just loses right away. Bishop takes g5, and um, white just crashes through with no problem whatsoever. All right, if king to g8, trying to get out of the way, get off this long diagonal, well, now white plays f4, knight c6, and now knight f5, and here he comes. If bishop f5, e takes f5, and the pressure on the g file is just winning, uh, g takes f5 is just death wish chess. I mean, white probably plays queen h5 there, and um, threatens queen takes h6. That looks like it's going to be decisive. There might also be lines with knight e7 and bishop f6. So let's say bishop to f8. Well, but now queen h5. Threatening rook takes g6 check. If bishop g7, well, knight takes g7 if nothing else. And then white regains the queen. And the bad news for black is that he's still not finished suffering. Knight takes e7. Check, check. And, okay, we can windmill him, or we can play e5, threatening rook h7 and rook h8 mate. Black is lost here. So king to g8 after rook to g3 does not hold. Okay, well, how about king to h8? Similar idea. Um, getting the king off the b1, h7 diagonal, but this time without walking into some new pins on the g file. Well, it turns out that white can do the same thing. f4, knight f5 anyway. And on g takes f5, maybe rook to takes g7 is good. e takes f5 is probably good. But he can even play queen to h5. And black seems to be lost here. The basic point being, let's say f takes e4, bishop to g5, and black's position just is collapsing. 
All right. So I don't see a defense. Uh, in the game, he tried h5, but now knight f5 yet again, tripling up on the e7 pawn. Um, if he takes on f5, this is, again, just suicide, queen h5 check, and I don't know. Um, what do we do here? I mean, even e takes f5 looks incredibly strong. Just threatening f6. Okay, so f6 would be the, the obvious rejoinder. Okay, does this give him any real chances? Just queen h6. Yeah, it's queen h6. It is the end of the world. So, um, black has no hopes there. Alright, so in the game he tried... Okay, he tried bishop f8. Bishop f6 might be the last chance, but... Um, bishop takes f6, and then b3, and white's just up, um, well, white's not up anything yet, but clearly better. When the knight retreats from c4, the knight takes d6. And, of course, black can't play g takes f5, because queen h5 is mate. So that's not an option for him. All right, well, instead of that, black played bishop to f8, trying as best as he could to just not make any further weaknesses in his position. But, same idea, b3... Knight b6, knight takes d6. And here black's last chance, absolute last chance, was bishop to g4. And after rook g4, queen takes d6, rook g3. Black has achieved a normal position, so he's not going to get mated anytime soon. His king is safe enough. It's basically that he's just down a pawn for nothing, but at least there's nothing more than being that pawn down at this point, so he could at least keep playing. In the game, he played the immediate knight takes d5, but this is not as good. After e takes d5, now we're also threatening the knight, and we're still threatening the rook, of course. And after bishop g4, rook takes g4, um, there are new problems. So we play queen takes d6, rook to g5, and now we're threatening this, and we're threatening rook takes h5. So now it's two pawns and a great position to boot. Black played queen f6 and resigned. Um, again, no no compensation for the uh, the material down, and he still has a, a bad king. Okay, so a very nice attack, and um, you know it was remarkable. Just rook to d3, followed by rook to g3, and Black's position was um, immediately imperiled. So very nice attack. Okay, finally, um, I'm going to show a game between another one of our regulars here, Flint Eastwood, and Galodian. Actually, I'm going to have to put this one on hold for the next time. So. Stay tuned. Um, it's very interesting, but it'll have to wait for the next show. So this one's gone on quite long enough. Uh, I appreciate your patience. Hope you've enjoyed it, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.